delivered, which at that time was very expensive. There was Uber Eats, but I had to pay out of the butt for it. And then luckily COVID uh, came in and uh, uh, made having groceries delivered a little bit more common. So thank you for uh, hanging in with that. That that was a long explanation, but the point of it is those are the things that had to be included from a, in a letter to the from my dead now dead attorney to the other attorney, the attorney for Johnson and Johnson to have a specials package put forward. It looks as though he never did that. Now. If we were suing him for malpractice, a judge would say, oh, no, that's malpractice right away. That's it. You don't have to prove anything else except how are you going to prove how much you lost by him doing that? Well, maybe as soon as you say maybe we would have gotten, the judge says, dismissed. We don't, we don't award people money that maybe they might have gotten. We only award people money in the event they get, they, they can prove their damages specifically. Uh, unless we could get punitive damages like in this case. So we need all, I know we've said this a hundred times, we need to all know what is in our file. We need to then know from that what was sent to the attorneys on behalf of Johnson & Johnson. We need to know then what did they say? Did Johnson & Johnson look, do we have anything in there that tells us that they actually examined your specials package looked at it, and what did they say that made them come up with the offer they did? And that's how we all come back to here saying, I need to know, so how many of you people accepted the offer and maybe are now out of the case mentally? Or maybe you're in the case saying, I accepted it because I had to and because I did not believe Glenn when he said, you know, uh, don't take those offers. Well, I thought maybe Johnson & Johnson would go under or something like that, so I took the offer, but I'm still angry. As opposed to how many of you still have a claim out there that has not been litigated? I'm still of the opinion that there are only two possible ways this can end, and this is why your attorney, meaning my attorney, and is constantly clawing at you to get you to accept the offer. There are two endings to this case. Well, I think three. Sooner or later, and this could be tomorrow. As a matter of fact, it could have been last week. The judge, Judge Kincaid, will send a notice to your lawyer saying it's your turn, time for trial. Your lawyer then has to show up at a hearing. The date would, will be set in the electronic notice that the judge sets out. So let's say the hearing is, you know, let's say it's November 1st of 2021. Your lawyer shows up electronically to this hearing. Judge can see his face and watch him talk. And the judge says, Mr. Lawyer, are you ready for trial? He has to say one of two things, yes or no. Those are the only two answers. What you usually hear, especially out of bullshitters like my attorney, is, uh, Your Honor, we're not. It's not our fault. Uh, there was a lot of rain last week. My back hurt the week before, blah, 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 blah. And the judges usually say, I'll give you one more chance to get ready for trial. And after that, I'm going to dismiss your case. Now, my lawyer continues to send me letters that do not address that in any way. He thinks I don't know anything about it. He is, he's hinted, this is the one that died, has hinted that if they tell the judge that they were just waiting for the case to settle because the Johnson & Johnson promised that all the cases would settle, by law, that is an insufficient grounds. That is not grounds. Uh, no judge can legally grant a continuous continuance based on that unless everybody agrees. And even then, that would be look, looked at with the fisheye. 
you are not you are not allowed to not prepare your case for trial even if you're certain that it's going to settle that is not a valid excuse for not doing the work you're expected to do all the work and to show up for trial and if the case settles well then good and usually that's good because the client gets a much better settlement where the lawyer has done the work than if the lawyer shows up with a file a half an inch thick. You know, your file in this case, if you see a paper file, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure if the lawyers, when they go uh, downtown Dallas there to the uh, court, to Judge Kincaid's court, I don't know if they bring their entire file or if it's just electronically on their computer. But if you see their paper file, it should easily take up one full uh, legal carton. In other words, those boxes that are about 12 inches across and about 24 inches wide, it should take one of those up without any doubt. If your file doesn't, your lawyer didn't do the work. He just did what my lawyer did and told me, they, well, he'd hinted that this was appropriate, that just we filled out the papers that got us into court. All we have to do is just sit tight and sooner or later Johnson & Johnson will pay us off. Well, that's what my lawyer thought would happen. But as you know, we've talked about this before, what threw the case off was those million dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars of verdicts that the people for us got. Those people got verdicts of hundreds of millions of dollars. And so people started to listen to people like me who said, you're in line for that money. You too. Do not accept cheap and that is why, if your lawyer, this is what I was getting to, this is the payoff. If your lawyer sent an estimation to the court of what is your case worth and did not include the likelihood that you will get punitive damages, and there's a right way and a wrong, wrong way to do that, he cheated you. In other words, like mine did, by not putting in any mention at all of the likelihood of punitive damages, he made sure that what came back from the court-appointed case ruiner, ruining cases, was a lowball offer worth nothing. And that's what they offered. And that's what I've told him to shove up his ass. So the wrong way to do that was to, would be to say if you were the lawyer, to the court uh, mediator, arbitrator, and to say to him or her, well, hey, we want a chance at that. We want to spin our da-da-da. No, 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 you don't do that. You don't try to tell them that you're entitled to a, a, a windfall. No, no, no. You go back and you say, our client has suffered such grateful injuries and terrible treatment by Johnson & Johnson that previous juries, when they've heard about it, even though it was to different people, they've said that deserves punitive damages. Your client is deserving of $100 million in punitives from Johnson & Johnson. And therefore, my client is deserving of, give or take, $100 million. So Mr. Court, Officer, Please, when you come up with your estimation as to what this case is worth, please include $100 million on top of that as punitive damages or explain to us why you're not doing it. I don't believe my lawyer did that, but I don't. he never sent me a copy of what he sent. He never acknowledged to me, did he send anything? Or was he not obligated under Kincaid's request parameters was he not obligated to set I don't know he never answered these before he died well what about the people that took it over the people who took it over just ignore me I send them a letter a month by FedEx that details every question I've got please I have all these questions for you I've already asked you this many you've answered zero here's the Questions that uh, have come up since I sent you the last letter, those would be, did you find that you were obligated under the judge's September 11th order 
to file a statement of the case, including a statement from uh, expert witnesses saying that I have a case. Did you do that? Did the judge say he was satisfied with it or did he make any comment about there has to be more? Uh, I understand, nonetheless, that the state, that the court arbitrator sent out an award that would probably tell me you sent in something, but I have a copy of the file here and there's nothing in it to that effect. If you sent it, did you include the fact that I was incontinent for a year? That embarrassing fact is worth big money. If, uh, if it was a, a woman, it's worth even bigger money. Did you tell the court, now this is me asking my lawyer who's now deceased, did you include in there a picture, I don't know how we gotten it, did you include a picture of the 8 to 10 inch red ugly scar on the side of my hip that is a remnant of the surgery that stopped the pain? Did you, where did you get that picture from? Next question. Did you include any mention as to the three-eighths inch difference? I thought it was two inches, by the way. I think I've said that a couple of times, but I finally measured it with Dr. Rana, my wonderful surgeon. That's only three-eighths of an inch difference, but that's a lot. I went back. I said, did you have any uh, mention of the three-eighths inch difference and what kind of hardships that causes me, including not being able to go work out. I can't work out with one leg three-eighths of an inch shorter than the other. You fall over. It makes you dizzy all the time. You can't walk without being dizzy. And I said, did you send these to the arbitrator? Did you send him the things that I discuss all day, every day about punitive damages? Don't know. No clue. So we have to find those things out so that we know where we stand, why did we get such lousy awards, and if we can, if we still have a case, and you might still have a case even if you settled the award, if you decide you want to go back to court, if you can find a lawyer who will do it, and it's just about impossible, but if you can find a lawyer who will do it, we have to ask for permission to send a new statement of damages to the court and ask that same guy to take a look at it and give us a new verdict based on the facts that our attorneys did not reveal. That's going to be almost it for today. That's an awful lot to take in. I'm sure if you were trying to take notes, you were frustrated, but I'm going to clean it up by, by giving you some big news. I believe, I said believe, I believe I've come up with a way around this. As, like all other legal maneuvers, it is not certain. But I believe that we have a move that we can make as a group to get us in front of these attorneys. By these attorneys, I mean that the attorneys that we've had who are threatening us, and I believe you, you're being threatened, but I don't know. It would help me if you told me, and I'll get you that email address on the next show. If you told me what exactly what you were offered by the court arbitrator, what you were offered by Johnson & Johnson after that award, and if there was one, what you were offered by Johnson & Johnson before that award, have there been any subsequent negotiations? In other words, none of us seem to know is that number where Johnson & Johnson is stuck, or if you come down $10,000 higher than that, will they say okay? But let me know all of those, and from that we can go forward and find out is our next step as a group to ask the judge to lift the stay order? That's one possible answer. And by stay, the stay is the order the judge put that said there's to be no discovery anymore. You've had <laughs> eight years or ten years to get it done. There's no more discovery. There's no more interviewing the doctors. No don't dep Those are depositions. No more interrogatories. Those should have been done in every case. No more requests for admissions. That's something else you do. Those should have been done in every case. Every time you send those, there's always some fighting with the other side about why they didn't answer them or why they gave you a 
canned, pre-packaged answer that means nothing and escapes saying it.